is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering One Piece, episodes 476, 477, and 478. Luffy at the end of his tether, an all-out battle at the Oris Plaza, the power that will shorten one's life energy, energy hormone redux, and to live up to a promise, Luffy and Kobe collide. In these episodes, Luffy is trying his best, but I have finally reached a point where I'm starting to go, what if Luffy doesn't win this one? And I don't think I have ever been concerned about that. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everyone. Thank you so much for joining me, and thank you to Michael for commissioning this episode. I am Natasha. That was weird. I did my intro out of order. I don't know why I did that, but hi, everybody. I am Natasha. Um, Yeah, I am just really surprised at the fact that I have even gotten to a point where I'm at all considering that Luffy doesn't come out on top. And I just want to be clear, like, when I say that, I don't mean that Ace is killed. Um, I actually do still have full faith that Ace is going to be rescued. But what I mean is that it may be someone else that saves Ace and not Luffy. He has pushed himself so hard. I really, for the record, wouldn't be upset at the concept of having a win for Luffy that is actually somebody else finishing the job that he started but was unable to finish because what the series one piece is like ultimately about we all need a support system we need our friends right we have chosen family a lot of the time and i feel like if the the direction things went was so yeah, this, uh, sometimes just being tough and brave and badass, and even personally having a lot of strength and talent, sometimes that isn't enough. Sometimes you need to admit you can't do it and let your friends who can take up the slack. I feel like that's actually kind of a great message. Um, and you know that at the start of the series, the whole theme other than we need support systems and friends who believe in us has been to pursue your dreams, despite what people may say to you, how they may react when you tell them what your dreams are, that you should never give up on them, that you should always honor what you're passionate about and continue to make it a priority and work hard to make it real, not just expect that it will happen for you. And there, I have had a very sort of mixed response to that as a lesson because I believe that it is deeply important to just go with it and really commit. But I also think that even doing that doesn't guarantee a win. There are just going to be some things that don't work out. And I hesitate to to word things in such a way that it comes across as like, if it doesn't work out, you didn't try hard enough. I don't really think that's what the show is saying either. I'm not trying to suggest that. It's more that there is a sort of every single person on the show has managed to reach their dreams eventually that I feel like does set people up for thinking all I need to do is fight through and never, ever, ever give up and eventually I will get there, which actually isn't true. But all that said, I do really like that in this episode, we have a one-on-one where Luffy is talking to, I think he's talking to Aokiji, and Aokiji is the one who says, you're really brave. I will give you that. But sir, being brave isn't enough. Even if you are brave, if you go in 
unable to compete with the people that you are fighting with, you are still not going to win. And that's just facts. And I know Aokiji is like, he's an enemy, right? So there's a big part of me that feels like I'm hearing this from him because the point is going to be very shortly that he will be disproved, that Luffy will be able to do it. But I really want to point something out here, guys, because I know that this is something that's been on everyone's minds in terms of like introducing me to the series and the way that the series has continued for as long as it has. The writer, Oda, has been notorious for pushing himself in a way that wasn't healthy, right? for overdoing it and basically having some like collapses, some issues with his health because of the fact that he was overworking himself. And this episode has Luffy actually coming to a point where he is asking for another injection from, uh, from, oh my God, I keep wanting to say bone clay, Iva. Ivankov, despite the fact that the one injection that he had episodes and episodes back was supposed to basically bring him to the very brink of what he would be able to survive. And he insists to Ivankov, I need you to do it again. I know it may hurt me. It may even kill me. But the thing is, if I don't do this, I am going to wish I were dead anyway. So please take the risk. You have my permission. Do this thing that is going to put me at risk. I accept those risks with my eyes totally open, understanding what I'm asking of you and not holding you responsible for what could happen to me. This is my choice. And I even like the fact that Luffy explicitly says if I don't do this, I'm going to wish I were dead anyway, because that matters. And I think he's sincere in that. I don't think that he's exaggerating one bit at all. Not at all. However, I do really want to just point out the fact that Luffy is like really on the verge of killing himself. And yes, it's for something he believes in. It's on behalf of someone he loves a person that he feels like I owe, I've made promises to. All of that is valid and true, but it also is the sort of thing that I could see somebody internalizing in a way that isn't exclusive to genuine crisis situations like this. Oda has been pushing himself to finish this series, to continue producing at a rate that is frankly like inhuman to expect. And I, I do not consider writing this series to be worthy of treating yourself that way. You know what I'm saying? Like it just feels to me, it's a, a manga series. And yes, it's a big deal. It clearly makes a lot of money. It's hugely popular. The fandom out there is serious. It matters to them. It matters to you. However, ultimately, this is a creative process that is supposed to be fun. It's supposed to be enjoyable for the creator as well. And if you get to a point where you are just having to shove yourself along, like on crutches, because you are ready to collapse due to overwork now it feels like you are not actually honoring the message that you're sending. And I'm not trying to like blame Oda because I'm certain that there is a whole societal like culture behind this. I'm sure that the people who publish him are also hugely responsible for the way that he approached his work. So I acknowledge all of those pressures and I'm not trying to just say that, you know, I'm, what I'm saying is simply that Oda has, he is like at this point known for approaching his work with a certain attitude 
And seeing Luffy pushing himself to the very brink hits just a little bit different knowing that about Oda. It's not like it ruins it. I, I'm not saying that. But it does sort of like recontextualize what I would see otherwise as like a, a wholly noble self-sacrificing journey. And it makes me stop and kind of go, ooh, you know, like just sort of a, a moment of, Oh man, like, I hope he's not trying to tell himself that's what he's doing with his work, you know? And I may be completely off base. Like, I just wanted to acknowledge that because the the idea of eventually, what if Luffy can't do it? What if he does collapse? And he has to trust the other people who are also here for the same purpose. The other people who had his back from the start and who have told him this whole time that they are in, they are doing this by his side and they care as much as he does. There comes a point where you don't get to control what everybody does and you just have to take them at their word and believe that they care as much as they say. And maybe they can't care as much as you do because he's your brother, not theirs. But you can at least believe that they are going to do absolutely everything in their power to finish the job the way that you would want. So anyway, all this to say that I, uh, I don't, I'm, I'm not trying to say that if this goes another way that I won't enjoy it. I'm not saying that at all. I am just saying that if Luffy does lose if we wound up going in a real different place with this than usual and it were handled a certain way i think that would be kind of exciting and it would be kind of a departure all things considered the way that we have seen luffy up to this point has been really unstoppable always wins no matter what he'll go through hardships but he always comes out on top and i would not be averse to a luffy that loses sometimes it would be very interesting, actually. Um, so anyway, uh, to, to, starting from the beginning here, once again, we have the coded ship appearing. You know, we get a lot of like recap of the end of the last episode as we do. Um, fucking Whitebeard just going for it. And he's uh, saying, like, just kill all of the Navy. And uh, we the the admiral i can't remember his name right now he says like well we're gonna have to really let like let out all the stops guys because this battle could very well be our last and then we jump to ivankov <laughs> he is jumping from iceberg to iceberg and, you know it's made clear that all of these icebergs they're like free floating they're not connected to things and he has devil fruit powers so he's like struggling to not fall into the water because he would actually drown. And he's doing that whole thing like, oh, God, it would be so terrible to end like this. But then he just says or not and catapults himself off. And I was expecting it to be a little bit more graceful when he said or not that it would turn out he had nothing to worry about at all. But no, it was actually just slamming himself like face first into a wall and just being like, oh, we're fine. We get... And it's such a throwaway line, but we get this moment right after that, that I laughed. I don't know why this, you know how certain, like, it just the attitude of a character being a little bit out of character will just get you. So I was standing like right by the wall and you see the shadow of Jinbei coming up out of the water behind him and Jinbei starts to talk and I was like, shh, and push, pushes his ear against the wall. And there's a pause and Jinbei looks stunned and then just says, I cannot believe he just shushed me. And that really was so funny. I, I think it might have been the voice actor's delivery as well. That shit cracked me up. He's genuinely like so hurt. Um, So, yeah, he's talking about how like, all right, we've got to get to the other side. Like, 
we've got to make sure that we have Luffy's back because who the fuck knows what's happening to him goes through all of these like maybe he's been shot maybe he's been burnt to a crisp yada 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 you know just uh and then we see here comes Aokiji with his fucking ice powers this dude is out of hand I can't believe the levels that he like I know that I saw some bonker shit way back in the day when he was able to freeze like a whole ocean and and create like a, a bridge for a migrating people but i still forget the scale of what he can do so he is able to zap whitebeard here and get him encased in ice and everybody's like haha we got him he's a popsicle and of course all i can think is like you got him guys the man doesn't have any expression on his face that indicates to me that he is worried about his current state. He just looks like he is ready to murder. And sure enough, despite not really moving, you see the ice beginning to tremble. And then it starts to crack. And of course, it turns out this ice can't hold Whitebeard. He just is able to get the fuck out. And uh, Eokichi is like, God damn it. I was hoping that I would be able to make it so that he couldn't create those vibrations. Like, but it turns out they can't be frozen. And he becomes airborne and he comes for Whitebeard and Whitebeard just manages to get him right through the gut with his uh, sword. I don't even know if it's technically a sword. Halberd. I don't know what you want to call this. But um, for a second, it's like, oh, my God, did he kill him? Of course he didn't kill him. Apparently, anybody who's like eaten a devil fruit, whatever, if it turns out that they are like have control of a particular element, it seems like their body just becomes that element. You know what I'm saying? So that they ultimately, I don't want to say that they're immortal, but like there is a little bit of they are effectively immortal in many ways i don't really know how else to say that but the the way to kill them it would be a lot more complicated and involved than killing a regular person i suppose would be the other way that you could say that um so yeah he's fucking like ice and seems like oh no problem i'm fine and as he demonstrates this, as his whole body begins to turn to ice, Jozu, who's the one that can like make half his, I, I don't know if he can do only half his body or if he just tends to do only half his body most of the time. I can't remember, but he is able to uh, punch him with his like diamond arm and causes Aokiji to break into so many pieces. I had a moment of just like, wow, did that kill him? But we watch Aokiji beginning to reform right before our eyes, like the T-1000. And I really enjoy how he finally gets an expression on his face because this dude is like unflappable. Aokiji just always seems like he is in full control of his emotions. He is not worried. A lot of the time when he's fighting Luffy, he's fucking yawning in the most obnoxious way possible. There's just often this sense from him of like, I don't even want to say like you're all beneath me because it's not even quite that that would suggest he was more engaged than he even is i would say it's more like he is like doesn't really want to be here he's phoning it in a little bit you know and yeah i just uh enjoyed seeing him materialize out of the ice and look truly pissed and be like, God damn it, I fucking had him, you know? Meanwhile, Garp is watching all of this. And he is really starting to, like, get twitchy. He is having a hard time watching all of this going on. Luffy coming toward them, like, saying how he's almost there. And knowing that Luffy is likely to wind up, you know, somehow dead. And the the energy of it is like he is one second away from snapping and betraying the navy but i couldn't tell if that 
was really what the risk was here. You know, I was like, what if, what if I think that it's, he's like at the edge because he's worried about betraying the Navy, but it turns out he's actually worried about betraying Luffy and Ace. You know, what if it's the exact opposite? I don't know. On the sidelines, Helmeppo and Kobe are watching and Kobe is remembering the time that he had told Luffy the two of them would eventually fight and that he would be so high up in the Navy that he would be able to stand up to him. And it's weird because like Kobe just keeps on. I feel bad for him in a way. It's he, he really wants, to, he just wants to be a part of things. He wants to be involved, but nobody's really looking for Kobe. I don't know why he thinks he needs to be in this. Like you just are so out of your depth, my guy. I just, nobody expects this of you. And it feels very, it feels like Lyndon in Cradle, forgive me. It's been a while since I've made a Cradle reference, I feel like. So I believe I'm due. Although somebody listening might be like, mm, you did one last episode. So sorry about it if I did. <laughs> but uh, there's just a sense of like Kobe is so used to being pointless that even though he really has no place here, this is not involving him at all. It's just him wanting to prove to himself that he isn't useless. And that is the wrong reason to do this sort of thing. My guy, you know, getting involved in a conflict of this scale, this has been going on, you know, how many episodes have I covered? I mean, this has been months that we've been here now and we have some of the biggest players in the game and you are here trying to get involved because your ego can't handle being on the sidelines, bro. That isn't the vibe. That's not the reason to push yourself into the midst of all of this. That doesn't, that's not, a, you know, it's just, so we have this like ongoing throughout all three of these episodes. And I'm really, this is going to be the last I talk about it for the most part, because it feels like they just want to remind us that Kobe is here and want to remind us about how he has made this promise to Luffy. And I'm just sort of like, guys, I know that probably Kobe is eventually going to play a role in the proceedings. I trust that. But newsflash, you don't need to remind me he's here every episode. You do not need to do that. There has been almost no forward movement for him of any kind. It's like just him. I made these promises. I want to do something. And Helmeppo reminding him, you aren't strong enough. They don't need you. Don't do this. And it's just back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Um, so in, in, in the midst of all of this, Momonga shows up. This is the guy with the uh, shaved sides and the top knot. With, uh, top knot mullet combo. It's a real weird sort of look. Uh, but he comes forward and says that he's the vice admiral and he uses shave and comes at Luffy and really thinks like, here it goes. I'm going to take care of this kid in one shot. Now Luffy is able to dodge shave better than I was expecting, but then he gets hit the next instant and he starts to do second gear as the dude who looks like a Dalmatian comes at him. So they're like tag teaming him right now, which I honestly take as a compliment. The fact that Luffy is considered dangerous enough that these guys have got to pair up now. That's pretty impressive, actually. Um, and Momongo can't help but be like, I can't help but admire the fact that he just doesn't give up. Because even after they knock him on his ass, what does he do? You know what he do. The same thing he always do. He gets the fuck up because he can't help himself. And as he is getting up, there's this weird sound. And he looks up to find, uh, oh my God, the, you know, 
the action hero guy uh standing there ready to fire a laser on him and we just sort of watch luffy get his ass kicked for a little while here it's pretty rough like he's just getting tossed around Garp is being reminded of his place and like whose side he's on because everybody can see he is having a really difficult time watching this. And I felt for him. Garp, you put yourself in this position, bro. I don't know what you're expecting to happen, but you should have just abdicated, honestly. You should have bounced and become a pirate too. Um, it's Kizuru. That's the guy. Uh, but take this word of advice. If you're simply not strong enough, no matter how courageous you may be, you won't even come close to saving him. So it's Kizuru who says that, not Aokiji. Okay. Um, but yeah, so of course, Luffy's down and looking up at Ace, he's really, really close. Ace is like going in and out of focus because he is so fucked up. And this is when Helmeppo is saying, like, he just can't complete, compete with the admirals. And Kobe is yelling, Luffy, get up, which is so funny because Kobe is like, just doesn't know what what to want right now. You know, like Luffy is the enemy, but also somebody that Kobe deeply admires and doesn't want to die. He doesn't actually want Luffy defeated. So he's very much in the same spot here as garp is um so <sighs> kizaru kicks luffy all the way across this bay right into whitebeard's open hand and whitebeard is holding him upside down like a a chicken whose neck he just wrung and luffy's eyes are like only white circles he's just saying ace but he is not conscious there is very little to him that is making any sense anymore. Um, and Whitebeard is looking at him and there's, for me, there's like a sense of him seeing young Ace in Luffy. He thinks to himself like, my God, the kid's nearly dead. And I guess that's partially my fault. Or maybe it's Kizuru who says that. It's unclear. I thought that it was Whitebeard blaming himself, but maybe not. Um, so Kizaru, like he has another laser that he has gearing up and he's about to fire and all of these people get in the way, but you hear somebody just start yelling, don't do it. Don't you, did, uh, didn't I tell you Luffy was going to be in trouble? And everybody's like, where's that sound coming from? And they look up and it's Iva's giant head. And some guy is like, why is that face so gigantic? And another guy just says, I don't know. I think he just does that, which is correct. But it is funny to just be like, he just does that. Um, Ivankov, meanwhile, his head is so huge that he's actually having quite a hard time holding it up. And he winds up like tipping over the side of the wall, which I found hilarious. That had never even occurred to me that he could make his head too big to, to actually hold up. Um, so yeah, Whitebeard is still holding Luffy and he says to Iva, I think this is yours. You've got to treat him. He's done all he can do and he's just really not going to be able to manage anymore. And he tosses Luffy to his men and he fucking wrestles with them for ages and starts screaming about how he's my brother and I can't let him down. And we get in the midst of all of this, all these flashbacks of their relationship and growing up together. Um, but he tries to like keep running and says like, I'm so close, I'll save him. And then he just fucking falls down again. It's really hard to watch you guys as he's just running forward and literally collapsing like in front of a crowd of people he means it when he's saying it but he can't do it and they gather around him and i really like didn't realize how much i missed tony tony chopper until this moment but having like some random medical dude show up i was just like who the fuck are you and where's my fucking get, get my friend back I meant to bring it out. Owen got me a chopper sticker while he was at a con the other day. And it's really cute. Um, but 
anyway, so yeah, they all gather around and they're just like, all right, we've got to, we've got to hold on to him here. But Whitebeard himself doesn't give Luffy the same, you know, he admits that he has a soft spot for Luffy, but he doesn't have the same what's the word I want? I don't know if, know if admiration is even the right word. Cause like the Navy guys, when they're up against Luffy, they're like, well, I will say that he never gives up, but he says Luffy is like reckless and clumsy. You know, he's a lot more critical than anybody else has been so far. And I can't help but feel like, I hope that there will be a point where this is over that Luffy can, get taught something by Whitebeard because it seems to me he's got the makings and he's got the determination, but he doesn't have the finesse. And perhaps there will come a time when Luffy is able to wield his abilities a little bit better. Um, so anyway, this is when Whitebeard, he starts to like use his, his wild weapon. I can't remember what this thing is called. And, uh, the other admiral, who uh, he is the one that I have interacted with the least, the one that can do I, Akainu, I think. Um, he has that like magma power. Him and Whitebeard face off directly against each other, and we get another extremely awesome, like one of those anime esque white blue versus red orange like light shows where their powers go directly in half against each other in this sort of spherical and it's very sort of picturesque. We jump over to what looks like a Gesha who's in the midst of a fight. I don't remember having seen her before. Fill me in anybody if uh, if that's necessary, if I've forgotten her and we have met her. We have Mihawk who's going up against all these dudes and they are still like they're getting knocked down and they're getting up again in true tub thumper style. I can't help, you know, but be like, well, if you guys don't even have devil fruit powers and you're doing that, goddamn, there's something even more impressive. And then of course we have Boa Hancock and she's just coming in and it's just like, I'm, she calls them then insolent wretches and says that she's going to attack anyone who comes between her and her sweetheart. I am here for it. She's attacking anyone. She's, she means it. She's going up against both sides here and does not care, turning so many of these dudes to stone. I mean, there's also an attack of bats. Oh, yeah, that's Moria. I forgot about him. Um, he's very excited because he's like, oh, there's even more corpses that I can control, which I keep forgetting. And that feels like maybe we should consider that a little bit more closely. That's all I'm saying. Um, so <laughs> back to Kizaru, he's got his, like, you know, the, the lasers that he's shooting out. Some dude comes up behind him, just a lot of like jumping between all of these admirals and all of them, like attempting to all of the regular soldiers attempting to take them down, even to their dying breath, they're reaching out and, unwilling to let go of the opportunity despite the fact that they're on death's door um and this is when like the rebel reinforcements show up and they're coming in we've got all of these kuma bots that are waiting and they're prepping to fire and as they're firing out i kept thinking like they just really feel like they're going to completely level this place you know, at one point, I think it's, um, I, th I think it's he's or maybe I can't remember who it is, but somebody says to uh, Whitebeard, like, are you going to destroy this entire city? And he's like, you can just bill me for the damages later, which I did think was kind of funny. Uh, Marco turns into a firebird here, like this Phoenix thing, and he's flying up there and they're trying to shoot him down and the bullets are just going right through him. They are not hitting at all. And uh, Kisaru is looking up and just being like, ooh, uh, this doesn't look good, actually. Garp in the midst of it all, still gritting his teeth. He literally has his eyes closed. Like, he just can't even handle watching what's happening below him. I'm sort of at this point, like, why don't you just take him out of the field? Maybe you should just, you know, like, but we see why not pretty shortly. 
as he's coming at him, Garp leaps into the air and he decks Marco. And this guy goes down so hard. He He's like in a crater. And Garp, it's he has barely broken a sweat. I can't get over the fact that uh, Aokiji is yelling at Garp because he didn't give him orders to start fighting. Honestly, dude, you've really got to start picking your battles because telling him, remember what side you're on, but then he actually fights for your side and you're mad about it. You are just going to have to get a grip and shut up. And we wind up finding out that Garp is this badass that is just legendary, basically. And we find out some of the story about him, which I thought was really fun. I don't think, correct me if I'm wrong, that we actually find out what his powers are specifically. But they say that Garp actually might be the strongest Marine that the Navy has ever seen. And here's the quote here. Uh, he didn't just fight Gold Roger, he beat his rival too. When Shiki the Golden Lion launched his attack on Marine Ford, Garp was the one who locked him up and impelled down. And you guys, the flashback looks so dope. <laughs> the flashback to him doing this fight, like the guys are both in these pinstriped mobster style double breasted suits and the coloring you know I, I it just looked so cool and i was like um can we please get that as a side story i would very much like to know the rest of that and see more of that animation because it looks really really cool um so yeah everybody is intimidated by this guy and whitebeard tries to be like i know that he's legendary but legends are only words <laughs> and uh Aka Inu is the one who's like, mm, somebody like you who kind of depends on your legend is, it's kind of hilarious that you're going to be talking shit about somebody else's, like, your glory days are long behind you, but you're still fucking standing here. So don't act like, unless you expect us to not take you seriously, that you shouldn't take him seriously. Uh, oh, yeah, he's the one, Akainu, who says, are you going to destroy this entire city? That's right. So, all right, jumping ahead a little bit here. Oh, here, here we go. Okay, because I knew that there was a point where, like, the camera kind of pulls away for a little while. Um, Luffy is still in really, really bad shape, and Iva is not sure what to do. He is so determined to help, but he you know, he doesn't want to push too hard, understandably. And eventually I've already mentioned Luffy being like, you have got to give me another injection. Meanwhile, Ace, who is up on the scaffold, I really appreciated this because like Ace eventually admits, I don't know how to feel because I really do want to live. Even after all of this, I don't want to die. But also everybody here for me and like as somebody I don't like I have I have this weird spot where I want attention I want to be made much of in the respect of like I earned that attention by doing something unusual interesting fun particularly beautiful you know like whether it's clothing I made makeup be you know, performance, whatever. At the same time, I don't want to be the cause of trouble. And so for me, thinking about how I would feel with all of these people showing up to rescue me, it would be agonizing. Like I would absolutely be reacting the same way that Ace is just trying to convince everybody what are you doing? It's not worth it. Don't throw your lives away. You know, it's very easy to say, like, just accept the help, buddy. But the the scale of this conflict is so bonkers that I could never be okay with it. I would just, you know, and I appreciate seeing Ace really struggling with it and being powerless. He's tried to, like, speak out and get everybody to stop, but nobody wants to listen to him. And then finally admitting that, like, 
he should feel less like he he feel it seems like he's ashamed of still wanting to live that he believes if he had more honor that he would be determined to like let himself die for the sake of his friends and that he doesn't want to do that means that he is somehow weak and I don't think he truly believes that, but you know how that is. Like you just still have got this sort of, there's a way that I, I think I should be behaving and that maybe a better person than me would be behaving and I'm not doing that. I just felt like this is the first time I really stopped and saw it from Ace's perspective and was like, yeah, this is rough. And we have a flashback here um, of him. Like there's a, there's this guy talking about Goldie Roger and saying, like, people talk like he's something special, but what did he even do? He just riled up a bunch of criminals. And thanks to that bastard, the entire world is screwed up. And Ace says, so what does that mean? And some other kid, and it's unclear how old these people are meant to be. They look like full-grown adults, while Ace looks like a child. But it's hard to tell. One of the kids says... Everyone knows before he was executed, he told some BS story about hidden treasure to give the uh, middle finger to the government. Either way, uh, even if it wasn't true, a bunch of dumb pirates believed him and he has left behind a mess that the Marines still can't clean up. Even killing the bastard wasn't enough. Now, thanks to him, we got to put up with a bunch of human gardens garbage gardens pissing on everyone else he's the biggest piece of crap who ever lived and he stinks even after we flushed him just like you kid and i was sort of surprised because i was like do they know that he's his son but i think it's supposed to be that like it's clear ace is a pirate or wants to be a pirate i wasn't really sure why they were targeting ace with this talk because I believed that his parentage was uh, a secret. But I, either way, Ace attacks them and is defending his father's honor here. And uh, that surprised me because it seemed like he, you know, had so left behind his father's legacy. But th this is when he was still really small. He leaves behind his father once he meets Whitebeard and is like embraced into a whole new family. At this point, he is still a child and he doesn't feel like he belongs anywhere. So his guardian comes up and is just like, Hey, uh, I heard you were starting trouble and nearly beat some other kid to death. And you know that every time you pull this shit, I'm the one that gets screamed at over it. I don't know what that guy was thinking, leaving a boy like you with me. And I don't know what either. <laughs> this person does not seem to want to be raising Ace. They don't, they don't have a good relationship the, based on the way that this person is holding themselves like very distant while talking to Ace and everything. There's just a feeling of like, they do not get along. And uh, I don't know if I like was told, I don't remember if this person has their own children and Ace is being cared for on top of their own children. That's always a, a tricky situation, you know. But um, anyway, then we see these other guys where like Ace asked to hear about Goldie Roger and this dude who's got this wild outfit and this heavy black mustache, but I think his hair is like white. Uh, he says that he was like a thief and a murderer. Only jackasses believe his crap. And he, he called himself king of the pirates. He was really king of the chumps. Either way, he's fucking dead. So who cares? And that's like the theme of this the whole flashback is Ace trying to understand more about his father and absolutely everybody he talks to thinks that his dad's a joke. Everybody thinks that he is way overhyped, that he didn't do the things that he claimed to do. And he punches everybody that insults his father in the face. Like 
just over and over again, getting into these fights after demanding an opinion, getting pissed at what he hears. Um, so finally we have Garp coming over and saying, you can't keep doing this, dude. I like, you know, I understand it. Um, but you, this has got to stop. And Ace says, do you think your grandson is happy with himself? At which point in the dub, they have Garp say he's growing up in fine feather, which is very funny to me. I don't know if this is the sort of thing where people have said it wrong for such a long time that we're now changing the way it is said. But the actual phrase that I think they were going for here is fine fettle, which means very good health. That's, you know, like that's what that is meant to me. But fine feather, I, I don't think that's anything. Correct me if I am wrong, guys, but I'm pretty sure they just got that wrong. And I think it's funny that like in the midst of all of this, nobody corrected it or seemed to <laughs> seem to realize, you know, um, but anyway, yeah, he says uh, that I think Luffy's doing pretty well. And Ace says, tell me the truth. He calls him old man. I always get mad about that. Did I deserve to be born or was it just a mistake? Which is a hell of a fucking question. I really felt for Ace. And Garp doesn't say, of course you were meant to be born Garp says, that's not for me to say. You just keep living and hope you find out. Which um, I respect that he didn't just outright say, of course, you deserve it. But also I was kind of like, dude, maybe just give this kid some reassurance. I don't know. Maybe he thinks Ace would see through it. So at this point is when we get Luffy like begging for the injection um, and Iva refusing to do it and Luffy saying, you know what I need? Like, I, I I won't be able to bear being alive if it isn't for if if I let him down after all of this. Then we have the whole thing with Buggy getting got by Aokiji's uh, ice and he's frozen in place and his men are hanging around being like, oh my God, I can't believe he's been taken down. He was going to conquer the world. And as they're talking about this, all of these comets fall. And of course, as these men who are surrounded in ice fall into like the hot water where the comets are, it melts the ice and they got they leap out of the water, but they, these fucking morons forget that Buggy can't swim. So they're like, oh, good. He's showing us how to unfreeze everybody. He let himself get hit by that attack and they just leave him there. And he has to be like, hey, guys, how about you help me like not drown before you just bounce? And they're like, oh, my God. We're so sorry. And I really enjoy the fact that they take more time to stop and like apologize than they do to actually save him. Christ's sake. We were blinded by your godlike glory and forgot about the devil fruit thing. Oh my God, these dudes. Um, oh my, I forgot about Mr. Three. He's still inside. We have been jumping back to him intermittently, but he's barely doing anything. It's it's just sort of him being like, I'll make my move, but he's there's very little progress make, made for him over these episodes. Um, so Whitebeard and uh, Akainu, they are fighting. He calls him a magma punk, which I do kind of like. I feel like magma punk's actually a pretty great username, and. Whitebeard is like fighting him and all of a sudden he stops and clutches his chest and falls to the ground and this friggin blood begins to pour out of him and I was so confused it's supposed to be I think that the wound that was already there has begun to open up more right but I had a moment of just thinking like wait did something happen internally like you know and we do have a flashback with him and all of those uh, 
hoses that were attached to him, all of the IVs, and him taking them off and saying in front of his men, I don't want no sympathy. There's no way I'm wearing this crap in front of my enemies. And all of the men telling him basically to put it back on, like in the background, the energy of his crew is very much like the fuck are you doing? Just taking it off. And Marco in the present is saying to himself, God fucking damn it. I knew this was going to happen. There's a real sense of everybody saying that Whitebeard is over the hill. They're not entirely wrong, you know? And I was sad about that. I just want him to keep being the biggest badass. Um, so more of the ice fighting, uh, Marco gets zapped right through the back and, Akahinu is like, all right, well, I guess it's going to fall to me to take you down, old man. And he gets Whitebeard right in the fucking guts with this like molten magma. I mean, that is a direct hit. It is pretty grim. And I was watching this considering the way that he like fell to his knees. I really was like, okay, I'm not sure he's getting up for this. Uh, Getting up after this, I should say. But this is when Hamepo is telling uh, Kobe, no offense, but they don't need you anymore. They all have taken care of each other. Um, don't run out there just to pick up scraps. It, if you were looking to test yourself against Straw Hat, he's out too. Even the strongest pirates in the world got stomped. Good to know we're on the winning team this time. Again, flashbacks with Kobe deciding what he's going to do. Luffy finally getting what he wants from Iva and getting the injection. And I love the way that Iva just says, it's your life. Give us a good show. What a great way to say it. I love that. It fits Iva's like whole ethos so perfectly too. I just thought it was really, really good. Um, so he gets up. He's fucking refreshed here and he just screams Ace's name again. I really would love to know just how much of the like voice acting is just him screaming. I'm coming Ace. I'm almost there Ace. Here I come Ace. It's time Ace. Get ready Ace. I'm almost there Ace. It's just over and over again, you know? Um, and Iva says, I need you to remember, dude. You may feel pumped up right now, but if you fall again, you are dead. So keep that in mind. Every uh, energy hormone only tricks your body into thinking that it's okay. It hasn't healed anything. And this is reminding me of like, and I I probably have made this comparison before, but in the Dresden Files, uh, spoilers for much, much later in the series, Harry Dresden eventually becomes the Winter Knight. And he has these like powers of stamina that he thinks are like extra powers granted to him by the power of the mantle. And he begins to suspect and soon somebody else sort of, I won't say absolutely confirms, but supports his hypothesis. I don't think, dude, that you are actually any stronger or actually have more more stamina. I think that the inhibitors on normal bodies that come from adrenaline, like that hold adrenaline in place and keep it from being released all the time. I think those inhibitors have just been taken down. And so your body is functioning at absolute full capacity at all times, which is not healthy. There is a reason why those kinds of rushes are meant for emergencies only. Your body can't handle that kind of strain all the time. So what what I think is happening is you're being allowed to access all of this strength and stamina, but the moment the mantle is taken away, the effects of doing this to your body are going to catch up to you all at once. And you will be effectively, like, you, you will be disabled, you know? Um, so my prediction here is that All of this is being set up so that we can have a long, long period after this battle is over of Luffy basically completely incapacitated 
And this way we can go into the stories of his friends without Luffy present for quite a long time in order to get them to meet back up again. That's just my prediction. And I, you know, maybe wrong. I won't, I, I'm not saying that that would be good or bad either way, but that's just what I think is being set up here. Um, but yeah, so Luffy after Iva says this is just like, well, in that case, I guess I just won't fall again. I'm going to fucking do it. Um, <laughs> and this is when, again, they decide that they're going to fucking attempt taking Ace's head off. I couldn't help but laugh because they were just like doing this before and Crocodile stopped them. They could have done this in the midst of this all at any moment, but they waited until he was back on his feet. <laughs> Um, so I was watching him run and he's like, all right, well, we're got to give him some backup. And Luffy begins to head right for the scaffolding again. No sneakiness, just dead on straight for it the way that he always does. And he is running at a rate that the Marines that are standing in front of him blocking his way. It's very clear that they were not prepared for the like level Luffy is functioning on at this point. And he just begins to lay into them. One of the dudes comes out with like a lasso and he manages to get Luffy looped up. But when the other guy who he's working with comes in to attempt to like kill Luffy, Luffy is able to take them both down and uses the lasso against them. And it's just like very abrupt and kind of embarrassing. And I was just like, man, that is dudes. You must feel really, really silly right now. Of course, this just prompts like more dudes to get up and be like, you can't beat all of us and go back to Kobe, yada, yada, yada. Um, and this is when I love this so much, you guys. I was so excited. So <laughs> Luffy is fighting off all of these dudes, manages to like get through them. And all of a sudden, here comes a laser. It's fucking one of the Kuma bots. I know that they're called pacifistas. They're Kuma bots. You can never tell me any different. They're targeting Luffy. And what happens? But Boa comes and stands in front of them. And is, they see her as a ally, as an ally. So they, they stop firing. And she just becomes a complete human shield to stop them attacking Luffy. And instead of simply stepping around her, they keep saying, like, please move. It was such a weird, it's so goofy, you guys. This is so silly. Whatever. It doesn't matter. But I do like the fact that she's so glad that Luffy said her name correctly again. Um, Shower me in sweet gratitude, my love. Oh, God, her fucking sparkly eyes. Oh, and Hancock, I owe you my life. Yes. Oh, she's such a goon. So she gets called back to life from by the Kumabots being like, Boa Hancock, please move. You are standing in the way. I'm like, dudes, you really could literally just step to the left. And there's a moment where she just stares at them. And I thought that this was meant to just be her uh, immovable. Instead, the next instant, she's flying through the air, screaming at them. I never gave you permission to address me in such a manner. And I love that. It turns out the look that she was giving them was just like, how the fuck dare you talk to me? And she kicks these kumabots and turns them into stone. And I loved her more than I've ever loved her. The scene was so silly. I just really, really enjoyed it. Um. I am almost out of time. I feel like I've talked about most of what's going down here. We've still got Aokiji fighting against Whitebeard. I love Whitebeard calling him Magma Brat. Like, what was it before he called him Magma Punk, I think, or Lava Punk? Uh, I think Lava Punk is better. But there's also a moment where one of the dudes comes and, like, thinks he's taken off Whitebeard's head. There's a big cloud of smoke. And it almost looks like his head's gone, but of course it's not. It's just, it's just an illusion. And these dudes are hanging on to the front of Whitebeard like they are decorative nipple tassels. They are just dangling off his nipples. It is the funniest thing. I wish you guys would go back and just see this moment. It's like minute 1630 on episode, what is this? Um, The last of the three, 478. 
that shit cracked me up so bad. Um, so yeah, he begins to just lay out, he's like treating his weapon like a scythe and just going through all of these Navy guys and scattering them like chaff in the wind. They are circling around him in a cyclone practically while he's just standing there with this giant gaping hole in his chest and all of the dudes are like i don't understand wait that's insane and the guys were just standing saying that eventually their own men begin to fall on their heads as if they themselves the men are shrapnel whitebeard is not here to play kiddos he is badly injured i'm not trying to say that he's unmoved but it's cost them a whole lot and Aokiji, meanwhile, is like, now's our chance. Go for it. And all of his men are just like, uh, I don't want to. Finally, one of them's like, all right, guys, come on. And it's our, it's, we've got to do it. Meanwhile, Whitebeard is like, he thinks that now's their chance. Get the fuck out of here. I'm fine. I don't think so. You're standing. And I will grant you that that is remarkable, but you are in bad shape, my friend. Um, so then we have like everybody who's joining in Jimbei grabbing up all of these dudes and chains and uh, a bunch of uh, what was the, there were some explosions and I can't remember who it was that did that stuff, but they have all all of our our big allies have surrounded white beard at this point and are just like you're gonna have to come through us um oh it's sengoku i kept calling him the wrong name i'm sorry i kept calling him aokiji sengoku is the uh the the top admiral so he has finally directed his men to go ahead and kill ace they have their blades above their heads ace is coming at them at top speed and is just like, oh my god, they're going to do it. I'm too late. I'm too slow. Whitebeard himself is also kind of panicking. I wasn't expecting to see the look in his eyes that we see. But he truly does seem as if he has lost hope at this point. And <laughs> I love Ace just fucking like managing. Even when he gets hit, he's still moving forward. You know, he just happens to bounce in the right direction. And the suggestion is that he's moving forward even as the blades are coming down in what feels like slow motion. Like he is moving faster than these blades can be swung. Um, and he just keeps yelling, don't do it, don't do it. The blades are coming down. And then all of a sudden, everybody is gasping, screaming at the same time. And Luffy just screams don't you dare. And I think pretty much everybody except for like the admirals, vice admirals and uh, the warlords, all of them like go down because he is using hockey and it's like serious. He has affected so many people at once here. The whole place turns like gray and blue. And the executioners fucking collapse. Every other man on the field has dropped. And Sengoku is still standing. I'm trying to see who else is standing. There's a couple of randoms who are still on their feet. Iva is still on on his feet. And even the uh, some of his own allies have gone down. Um, Heokiji, well, damn, this is a mess. <laughs> But uh, yeah, so Luffy continuing to head forward and Ace is sitting there looking truly stunned, like, well, I didn't see this coming. And I don't know if like Ace knows how to use hockey. I'm pretty sure that we saw him use it against Blackbeard, right? If I'm not mistaken. Um, so maybe he, he didn't realize that Luffy had progressed on using it, but I can't help but laugh. Like, Sengoku should just reach out with a knife and just stab Ace. Like, get it done, dude. You're clearly fine. You're standing right there. What's the hold up? But the last shot of this episode is Luffy coming forward with Iva right on his heels, just heading in to save Ace. And that is the end of the episode. All right, guys, I'm going to wrap up. Thank you all again so much for hanging out with me. I appreciate you all so much. Until next time, 
Toodaloo, motherfuckers.